Hi. How are you? How are you? Oh, I got, I got my, I got my tea. Perfect. Okay. Well, you're in another time zone, so that that's all right. I mean, it's all right whatever time zone you want to be in yeah. and drink wine. But anyway, I I'm so excited. I don't know where to start because I thought people should know. You told me a long time ago how you um, basically dropped out of school when you were 15 because of your obsession with kingfishers and learned to make, make yeah. your own blind when you were like 12. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was so obsessed. I look back now and think, I mean, I'm amazed how obsessed I was with kingfishers. I mean, they're only a little blue bird like that. But that that was completely all encompassing like my entire bedroom wall was covered in pictures of kingfishers uh, you know every book there was on them every present i had was about kingfishers from you know my mum, and you know it's just kingfishers um i'm not bored of them oh. but i'm not obsessed with them anymore but that's, that's oh but i just actually right. want to dive into that really quickly what happens when you lose obsession like so do you think like that was a good thing that you were obsessed with them though, right? I mean, that sets you on your Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, I think it's lovely to, if you've got an obsession with something in the natural world, it's wonderful because wherever you are, whatever you're doing, it's like if you're into bird watching or whatever, it's great. Cause there's always, you, like, there's always something to, I went to a rugby match once and I saw a cormoran and a buzzard and a gray wagtail. It was far more interesting than the rugby match. So it means that there's always something to do, something to look at. So I, I like obsession to a level. I think most of us are, when we all meet up once yes. a year as photographers, we're all obsessed. And I think, I also think it can be very unhealthy. So I'm a bit more on the fence about it these days. And I, I was much more obsessed with things than mm -hmm. I allow myself to oh, get that makes obsessed. sense. No. And then, and can we actually, I just want to talk about your childhood because it's incredibly inspiring to me. I think for, you know, I just, I love that you, you know, didn't enjoy school and decided you, you were going to, you know, you had this dream to be a Nat Geo photographer, right? I mean, way back then. And, and was, then you went from kingfishers yeah. to this obsession with otters. Otters. I, I mean, just love that. Tell me. I know that's, that's still an obsession, to be fair. I mean, I'm still working with otters a lot. And I still get really excited when I see one. So that, that exists. But I think, you know, that, that, those were my two childhood obsessions. And I think part of it was, um, you know, being myopically focused on only things I was interested in the kids. So I couldn't concentrate in class at all. I'd have like a two second, you know, ability to concentrate. So it was like sort of claustrophobia and boredom to me. And it was, it was horrible. And I, you know, it was a way of channeling, you know, because I didn't have that. I have this kind of very focused obsession. I had to find something and I guess it just naturally fell on those two subjects. And then that, that really consumed much of my sort of childhood and teen years. And then I ended up working, you know, pretty much on kingfishers and otters for a long time. Still are. Well, and still are. Like... Yeah. I know it's really weird. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing stuff on otters at the moment that's almost identical to what I was doing when I was 16 in the same place. Oh, and it's just... I mean, I think, you know, I've been talking to a few photographers and I will say this is a consistent theme with my favorite photographers is that like projects take years and years and decades and like those are always the best because you it takes time to understand and then to see the changes and find the meaning in things or what do you yeah, yeah I think you're right and it's about refining as well as much as the the, the obsession with the subject it's about refining our craft as photographers isn't it and i think it's best to do that on a, to do the same thing over and over again you know, when I, my first story for the magazine from that year was Kingfishers, and it took me six years. I did it in my spare time. And it was about absolute refining every image till I reached the best I could make it, and then moving on I, to the next image. And I learned how 
light. I learned technical stuff. I just learned so much from just doing the same thing over and over and over again, just tweaking it. Oh, tweaking I love it, that. And, you know, I also love your windy path. I think that's so beautiful for people to hear and understand that you don't have to be one thing and you can keep reinventing yourself. And can you talk a little bit about your, you know, you started off wanting to be a photographer and then, and then I'll let you take it from there. Then what happened? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think my, I can't remember my agent once told me I have a, a colossal ability to be bored. I can't remember. <laughs> I get bored really quickly. So um so i started out yeah i wanted to be a nat geo photographer when i was a kid and then i ended up becoming a, a camera operator you know a camera operator wildlife stuff at the bbc mainly because i couldn't figure out how to make a living as a wildlife photographer i mean it was hard in the 80s actually harder now i think but anyway so i ended, I ended up in tv and i was I, you know i was filming and then i got bored of filming because i didn't like what the producers were doing with my footage because i'm a total creative control freak in that sense so then i became a producer started producing and then i became a host narrator you know presenter <laughs> and then i you know i was making lots of tv shows but ultimately all i really wanted to get back to was photography and it wasn't until 2003 i think that i i started drifting back into photography and, and I only wanted to work for National Geographic and so I in my spare time I sort of built from scratch basically in, in my 30s started shooting again and built a portfolio up which I then finally got accepted into by Nat Geo and the result is I've never actually worked professionally for anyone else uh, as a stills photographer so I'm you know I am Nat Geo through and through when it comes to taking pictures because I don't know how to work for anyone else. <laughs> So I've never worked with the New York Times or, you know, all you guys have got this long history of, you know, being photojournalists. I don't have that. I've only ever yeah. National Geographic. And, and, and I love that. I mean, Kathy Moran, we should give a shout out to Kathy. She's, she's the one that got you on the track again, right? Yeah, I met her in, um, I just, just uh, shot a film back in 2003. I met Kathy in Bristol at an, at an awards ceremony. And I said, I want to shoot for you. And she said, well, show me some pictures. And I said, well, I haven't taken a picture for 10 years. And she said, well, all right. Well, if you can shoot stills like you shot that, she just watched one of the films I've done. Said, you can do that on stills, I'll give you a job. And that's, 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 you know, that's what took me six years. But she was brilliant. She absolutely stuck with me. And, you know, it went from replying to one in every 20 emails in the first year to replying to one in every 10 the second year. And, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was hard. And I, you know, I obsess over lighting of, you know, Kingfisher doing something and I would send it to her and sometimes I get reply or, and I, you know, these, these shots would take me weeks to get. And I remember once just thinking, my God, I've absolutely nailed this lighting. And she writes back, she goes, lighting's a bit fierce. I, like, oh. <laughs> I remember, there's a great picture. Go check out Charlie's <laughs> website too. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's, I, I love that story. and. I also love, I mean, I just always, I think that you're, it's so good to listen to you because I think um, there's these inherent lessons for all of us, like really having a thick skin and not taking things personally and like understanding the fine line between harassing an editor and just being persistent. That's a really good tool to kind of figure out. Can you talk, can you give people like a, a way of figuring out like, you knew to keep talking to her, but like not becoming a harassing human being. Is there anything you can say about that? Yeah, there is. A, I mean, I, I read the signals. So yeah, I wouldn't get a reply. But when I did get a reply, it'd be a positive encouragement. And so I would keep going. And I thought, okay, she's super busy. You know, I get it. I'm really low on the priority list here. Um, so yeah, it was kind of reading that. And not, I, I don't want to, you don't want to be a pain in the ass because, you know, people write to me and, and some of them I'm like, okay, cool. And some yeah. of them I'm like, okay, this is a bit harassing. Um, but I, I think, yeah, it, it was in the reply and sort of reading that. But I think the thing you mentioned about not back is that I, the other thing I did is I actually wanted to work for mm -hmm. someone who I really respected mm -hmm. and someone who said, go away this isn't good enough. 
sort it out and come back to me when you've done it properly. And Kathy did that, you know, she's the sweetest person in the world. And she did that so nicely. But I wanted that. I wanted to work. Something I'd sort of grown tired with in television was I didn't, it wasn't perfectionist enough for me. I wanted to work for people that really kicked my ass and made me really work harder, you know, and, and get better results and then look at them and think, wow, they were right. And that's why I, however many times I got you know, knocked back or a negative comment, I mean, she was brilliant because she would give me a negative comment, but then she'd say, why don't you try and do this? So I would to do it, I'd go away and do it. And so, you know, those early first few years working for Kathy were phenomenal because of that. Because I want to work for people that are better than me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, basically. Yeah. And, and then, and I also, I love your diversity in your skills and wanted to chat about that. And can you actually mention, you have a book coming out and and I think you make the best titles in the world. Will you let people know about your book that is already in the world and, and a little synopsis of what it's about, You Bought a Rainforest, and then your new title is phenomenal. So, yes, it's called I Can't Eat My Guinea Pig. I've Had Too Much Cocaine, which was, which was a long time ago, I'm going to add. But it's, I wanted to write a mm -hmm. very honest memoir about a long it was originally just about south america and that title actually comes from a bbc shoot when i was like 23 it's a funny giant anyway when i was a lot naughtier and um but then yeah back in 2012 2013 i bought this bit of rainforest and made a tv show about it and actually it, i turned out <laughs> i'd bought an illegal coca plantation in southeast peru <laughs> so it's a kind of it was a Originally, the book was originally sort of a memoir of my time in these kind of misadventures, I would say, in South America. And then, and then actually, once we sent it to the publishers, the editor just wanted to broaden it out across the world. And it became a book. I, it, it's, I would say it's a book on photography, but that's what it pretends to be. It's that, to me, it's actually a book on conservation. And uh, it's quite brutal and honest because, I, you know, I've seen the world change in since I started, you know, I started working when I was 16, I've seen a lot of change. And I wanted to, I guess, take the reader with me to, to on that journey. I didn't want to write a book about me, I wanted to write back and talk about the things I saw. And so it, and I also wanted the person I was and, and who I've become to be apparent. You know, I was a very privileged kid, I had this, I had that, I was very arrogant, I was cocky, you know, and I wanted to, I actually wrote it as I changed and I would hope became a better person, understood the world more. And I think particularly understanding the problems in the Amazon. And as you and I have discussed in the past, certain things in Africa, it really, it changed me and my view on things, my understanding of conservation particularly. So I think it's quite dark at the end. You know, say so I set out to write a stupid book, I actually wrote quite a serious and eventually dark book about conservation but also about burnout and trauma and uh, all these things I never thought I would be discussing and it's I, I don't know if you've ever written a memoir you end up having to look at your life objectively well as objectively as you can and you see all the things that you probably never really thought about because we diminish things you know so yeah it's quite interesting I come down well to I can't wait um and I'm kind of curious doing such a, I mean, a lot of people don't take the time to do that soul searching. And I find, you know, I, I find that you seem to have this ability to laugh in the most tragic situations. And I just. Yeah, it's called it's diminishing. Called <laughs> diminishing. It is though. It actually, it's not good. You know, I, I do brush everything off. And as I, as I get older and wiser, I'm learning to not brush it off. Because it's much easier to brush it off, isn't it? And make light of it or not really process it. And there's, there's lots in the book I write about. The, you, you know, you and I have seen some horrible things, haven't we? And I have not processed them when I've been there. I remember writing about, 
out. I was doing a story on wildlife poisoning in East Africa and turning up there's this dead elephant that had its tusks taken out and the tr you know the ranges had taken them they'd been poisoned and the and the trunk had been chopped off i've been lying in bed with dysentery for three days and it's like six in the morning i being dragged out to photograph this dead elephant it was, it was horrendous anyway we get there and there's like 30 maasai school kids in turquoise blue, blue uniforms trampolining on it and i get there and i'm like oh god we've got to get rid of these kids and i thought oh my god no this is this is the picture and it was an extraordinarily powerful picture of these kids playing on this elephant, which is completely normal to them. They just found it on the way to school. You know, it's just, it's their, their experience of this elephant is totally a, a world apart from ours. You know, they get killed by elephants on the way to school. You know, it's, it's a totally different thing. And they were having fun and I took all these pictures. And I, I kind of wrote about it in the book because I never ever processed it while I was doing it. It just built in me, just years of just death and misery just building in me and then eventually it all came out but it was I, I mean I don't know if you're the same you just kind of go into autopilot I haven't got time to stand around crying you know I gotta get a, I gotta get a shot and so there's no so I just diminish it all you know and so I think in conservation um a lot of us do that yeah I guess yeah I'm I'm glad to hear you're processing things. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, it's got to come out eventually because it all does. It all, otherwise it just erodes sits. you. Um, I, I yeah. want to switch subjects and talk to you another time more about this, but I, I actually, you know, I, the only way I can handle the despair and the, 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 you know, the realities of, of our world is to actually also, I think there's as much more, I actually think there's more beauty in the world than horror. And I am constantly seeking it out just to create balance in what we are shown. And I, it kind of circles back. I'm so privileged and honored that you're a part of um, this thing we're creating together, Vital Impacts. And I just want to actually add your image here to the, to the thread so people go check out charlie's gorgeous uh image of spinner dolphins and maybe you can talk a little bit about that image and what it meant to you and i can't imagine the feeling of being i mean dolphins are quite playful aren't they and that must have been one of the highlights or i'll let you talk about it yeah, I mean, I, I, okay, I'm just going to go back and we'll rewind a little bit because actually, it was actually a conversation you and I had, I think, in a hotel lobby in LA once. <laughs> but, but you said that, you basically said there's more beauty in the world. And it, it, you kind of, I remember we were talking, and I kind of changed something in me to stop going and shooting misery all the time because I kind of got into that. And Costa Rica was one of those first stories after that, which was a really amazing story about the Osa Peninsula or Osa, however we pronounce it. And so I went to do that story for the, for the magazine. And it was, um, we called it a rainforest to reef story. So it was about this extraordinary peninsula on the Pacific coast of, of uh, South West <laughs> Costa Rica. And the first three weeks, of the story because most of it was gonna be in the rainforest but for the first three weeks we just photographed dolphins and I think we had seven species one day i mean it was just the most one of the most extraordinary and wonderful shoots in my life but i was trying to get spinner dolphins and we didn't see a spinner dolphin for two weeks and then we were just burning so much money <laughs> i was just absolutely terrified but eventually we found them and you get these pods of like one or two thousand it's just mind blowing. So you jump in the water, they don't play with you. They just all, they come and have a look, but they just all swim past. And so we spent really a week toward, at the end of the shoot, just trying to do that. By which time I got my lungs quite good. So I could go down for like a minute and a half. You'd go down like 30, 40 feet and then just, you get ahead and then you just wait for them. And then this sort of wall of dolphins would come all around you. and. Then behind them with this yellowfin tuna. But there's so many of them that getting a frame that composed was really difficult. And that, I think the one we've put on Vital Impacts is 
I think it's the best frame because it's just it's just the it is poetry is there's I just I have only had the experience once of dolphins going by and they went so fast and you're just it is I mean I couldn't imagine what that moment was like for you I um yeah I love that image so much I tell you what it was like it was like desperately holding your breath so much that you don't wee yourself <laughs> <laughs> swimming as fast as you can for air because you're dying and you just the thing is when you're taking yeah. so if you just dive down and look it's okay if you're photographing you can hold off for about another 30 seconds because you're so busy but then when the moment you stop you're like oh my god i've got no air and I oh my god 40 feet back up and then you, you just explode out the water you're like <gasps> And then you go back down. <laughs> it's incredible. Nice. Let me just add it one more time. But um, this image, and then also, you know, your website. I mean, you. Um, and where is the best place for people to see some of your work? It is. I mean, you are one of the most prolific, diverse, and I would say photographer, filmmakers, writers, presenter. I don't know many people that have all of these skills. Um, but I would love for people to check out your work. Where should they go? Well, I'm hopelessly bad at updating my website. So I basically okay. just stick everything on Instagram. So, Google yeah. your name. <laughs> because I have too ADHD to sit and do a website. <laughs> I did one once and then I'll, like, every year I'll be, oh, I took some pics off. Few, no, Laura. I have I mean, you're amazing, an amazing uh, um, colleague, Eileen Mignoni, who I like to always give shout outs to. She and I, yeah. um, she, everything I do is together with her. So, and, yeah. Good. But, uh, well, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess I, are there, I, I know you're super busy, so I do, I'm so grateful for the time that you've shared. Um, I think there's probably a lot of aspiring people. By the way, I'm always going to mention we've got two $20,000 environmental photography grants that you can apply for right now. The deadline right. is, I think, um, mid-March, but you can go to our website. But it is a great opportunity to work on a long-term story. And I think that I just, I love talking to you, Charlie, because I think it's really important for people to understand how much time it really takes to dig into stories. And did you want to leave any kind of parting wisdom or inspirational thoughts for people? I get, I, so I, okay, so I get asked a lot. Um, I got asked a question today. Someone asked me, what equipment do I need to work for National Geographic, right? So I get some random questions, but I get asked a lot, what, so forget National Geographic, but how, how do you, how do you get a job in the industry? And it's very difficult because there is no standard way and it's not really an industry. And I'm talking about wildlife photography. I'm not talking about um, social documentary or anything. I'm just talking about <clears throat> wildlife photography. And I always say the same thing is that when you approach an editor or, you know, a magazine or whoever, you want something from them. And they've got millions of people who want something from them. The way to make it work is to turn the table so that they want something from you. And with, uh, when I started out with kingfishers and otters at the BBC when I was in my late teens, I was like the kingfisher and otter guy and they, like, they needed me. So I got loads of work. And I kind of sort of look back at that and I think that's the way to be. It, basically, I, I, I created a story, I created images, I just, basically found ways of making myself valuable to them. And then so I could, so I could flip the relationship and then the phone starts ringing. And that's often I find with the subjects that we know the most that have been neglected. Like, do you remember I did that vulture story or things like hyenas or just really like, why has no one done that? Like when we, I did Serengeti a few years ago, like, we haven't done Serengeti for 30 years. It's just staring us in the face. It's, it's finding things that are common to all of us. We all know these, these are animals that we know and just working on them, coming up with stories and, and making yourself happy. I think that is think that so true. Um, really, and going deep on something instead of surface across lots of, you know, a general thing like 
just for example, you, I get ph photographers that like to travel writing me all the time. I want to be a travel photographer. And I'm always saying the same thing, like just go deep on one thing. Cause any, yeah, locally. Yeah. Yeah. Locally, yeah. really. Exactly. And then, and same yeah. thing with like, you know, you take these things that you think everybody knows about must have been photographed billions of times, but turn the subject on its head. I love that. It's so true. So how do you, so yeah. So yeah. would you say it's like finding something in your backyard or make it the place your backyard? Like you moved when you were doing a story on Yellowstone, you literally picked up your family and moved there, right? Yeah, but I'm extraordinarily lucky. And I think, and you know, as a kid, I grew up in the middle of the city. So I had to get the bus to my Kingfishers and it was, you know, it wasn't very expensive. It was just a normal kid living in the city. And I think that, that the ability to do that, you know, my Kingfishers were an hour away um, and it didn't cost very much. And I could just, again, you, you just can't, you got your one subject, you're taking a deep dive on it and you're refining and perfecting your craft. I think there's a thing in wildlife photography where people think that the, just the subject is good enough to be the content. It's not. You, you've also got to be a photographer and you've got to learn to take good photos, whether it's a kingfisher or a phone box. You know, you've got to learn how to take good pictures. And I think it really works when you, well, as you just said, when you just find one thing and concentrate on it. Because otherwise you're just all over the place and your skill set's never going to develop because you're shotgunning True. everything. Yeah. And um, and you are, are you allowed to say what you're working on now in general or no? I, I, made, I made a film for oh, I don't know, 10 years. I used to make a lot of films. I haven't made one for 10 years. I'm actually directing and shooting a film. But artists. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. Oh my God. It's, it's so insanely, I've been in the edit today, it's so insanely cute. I, I love this. I mean, it. yeah. And I, and please, people, go look at his previous work about otters. I mean, they're, it honestly, it's like poetry. Little ballet dancers. They're so sweet. Oh, it's nice to make a film again, though, because it's been so long. But also... In that time, I became a stills photographer. So I'm going back to filming, but I'm shooting it all like a stills photographer. It's like the whole thing shot like f1.8 on a 35 mil prime. It's not. It's so much fun doing it, but completely different. I'm style so excited. By the way, so. okay. So I'll, I promise I'll let you go. But just one last question: What do you think the main difference is then between filming um, and and making still images? I think making still images is much harder. Well, that's my, I, I much prefer, well, okay, until recently I've much preferred still photography. I'm actually enjoying the film I'm doing at the moment. But I find still photography a, a more gratifying challenge. I mean, if I'm, if I'm given a subject and a prime 35mm lens and a camera and I've got half an hour to get some make some gold out of nowhere i love that challenge and that storytelling within that 35 more frame and trying to get all the stars to align without any manipulation mm -hmm. just i want i love it and when it doesn't happen i hate it <laughs> but when it does i i think that's my favorite thing it's getting i so i'm i'm someone who prefers looking at my photos in the evening than the process of taking them and it's the same when i'm filming I've, it's always been about the result oh wow the exactly yeah so it's not about me being out there doing it it's about sitting in camp in the evening or at my desk and downloading it all and going through it. that is the absolute peak of my happiness my that job. is so weird isn't that I weird i just like being in these moments in, and experiencing just the magnificence of this earth. And then sitting at the computer is like literally by a thousand cuts. <laughs> I hate it. Um, <laughs> I know that's... it's absolutely, I mean, if, especially if I'm in Africa and I've been, you know, I love all of it. I absolutely love it. I'm not diminishing it. What I'm saying is that there'll be, I get home in the evening and I, 
and I look at it and I find a frame and I touch it up a bit and I'm like, oh, I'll just stare at it for hours sometimes. Like, oh my God. Because the other thing is I, I'm, I don't attribute the pictures I take to me. They're not, they're mine, but I don't look at them as mine. I look at them as pictures. They're just the moment of time that I managed yeah. to capture. It's so I, I just stare at them just thinking, oh my God. But you know, I'm incredibly critical of 99.9%, .9 but the odd one, I'm like, oh No, it's, it's mostly, you're, <laughs> so you're just, it's a reflection of this beautiful world we live in, right? Like, yeah, because it's yeah, hard to brilliant. really, it's very hard to make something powerful. It is. But, um, oh, yeah, no, I mean, but I, I just, I love what you're doing. I, I, I'm so grateful you could make the time and, um, and cannot wait to read the book, see the films and see what else you're working on. But are you, um, and yes, I think everybody knows this next week is our seminar at Nat Geo. Will you? I'm going to be, no. I'm going good, to film good. Authors. <laughs> Much better now. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, um, it's so great to see you. Thank you very much again. And um, yeah. you too. Right. take care. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.